Mexico. Uh, we got a great webinar talking to Schneider Electric about their journey with uh, Zscaler. Uh, we will be starting just about the top of the hour, so we appreciate you taking time out of your schedule. All right, we're going to get started. Thanks for joining us. Apologize, I said we were getting started at the top of the hour. I had no intention of making you guys wait for 30 minutes. That, that would be terrible. Um, we are uh, going to have a great webinar today. We're um, here with uh, two great speakers. I'm going to introduce them. Uh, we're trying to be talking about uh, Schneider Electric and their journey to, um, uh, you know, uh, journey to security with uh, Zscaler. So uh, the, our first speaker is um, Johan Royer. Johan, you want to introduce yourself? Yes, hello everybody. I'm Jon Royer, Internet Service Line Manager for Schneider Electric. Great, and then we're also uh, here with David Creedy from Zscaler. David? Uh, David Creedy, uh, Product Manager at Zscaler, uh, primarily looking after endpoint security. Awesome, great to have you guys with us. We appreciate you taking time. Um, before we get started, a couple uh, logistics we want to talk about a little bit. Uh, we would love this to be an interactive webinar, so if you have any questions for us, uh, you can uh, ask by using the Q&A button. There's a blue button with a question mark on it. Uh, you can type in your question there, and we'll try to get to those at the end of the webinar. So if there's anything you hear you want to deep dive on or you want to ask uh, either of the speakers a specific question, here's your opportunity to get your voice heard. So use that uh, question and answer, and we encourage you to submit those, and um, we'll answer those at the end of the, um, at the, end of the, the webinar. Before we get started, though, just a little bit about us. If you're not familiar with Zscaler, we are the pioneer in cloud security. Uh, we operate a ginormous security cloud. We process about 50 billion requests a day. We have 100 data centers around the globe that allow users to connect to um, our security cloud in a very fast, uh, fast manner. Uh, we're in 185 uh, countries, and uh, many of the top uh, Fortune Global 2000 companies use us for their cloud security. Um, to enable a fast, secure user experience uh, when they access the Internet and their apps. Um, and then we also have global partners that um, uh, enable us to, uh, to con continue uh, delivering a, a secure experience. Um, so with that, I'm going to kick it over to, uh, to Johan um, and David. Uh, before we get started, Johan, Johan um, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, your, your background, where, where were you from, and what you do at Schneider Electric? Okay. so. Um as I said before, Johan Royer, I'm the Internet Service Line Manager. I'm working for Schneider Electric for 22 years now. Um, so that's my first and only company. Um, I joined uh, first as a security engineer. I worked for laptop security, uh, deploying uh, files. Then I uh, became a manager of the Global Network Operation Center for EMEA. And uh, I finally moved as an Internet Service Line Manager uh, three years ago. So the Internet Service Line, what it is, it's uh, the team that is in charge of all the roadmap strategy and um, of all services around the Internet. So mainly I'm in charge of uh, everything that is uh, related to uh, Internet security, proxy, firewall, DNS, uh, remote access, and uh, some uh, security um, solution like uh, micro or macro segmentations. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Johan. David, why don't you take a second to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, so, David Creedy, um, uh, Product Manager again. I've um, been with Zscaler nearly two years now. Uh, my background prior to that, I guess for the last um, sort of 12 years, has all been enterprise mobility. How do you enable mobile users, um, the advent of mobile devices, and how you secure them and, and manage those? Awesome. Great. Okay, so we're going to kick it over to uh, Johan. Uh, Johan, why don't you talk us a little, a little bit about through uh, what, what, happens at, what happened at Schneider Electric when you did, decided uh, that, um, that you, you needed to uh, explore Zscaler? Okay. For, first, a few figures about uh, Schneider Electric itself. Uh, so Schneider Electric is a multinational company, for those who don't know you. Don't know us, sorry. It's over uh, 170,000 employees worldwide. So uh, we have a presence in uh, more than 100 countries, and um, that's uh, we we are split over more than uh, 1,000 locations, approximately 1,200. Um, among these uh, 170,000 employees, 130,000 are connected to internet every month. Um, uh, our main business are uh, around uh, electrical uh, devices production and um, uh, management of the um, power management. 
Um, as you can see, for the four business and the four principal markets, it's going from the individuals in residential buildings to uh, industry, uh, passing to uh, data centers. Uh, and, uh, and, and networks with uh, brands like, such as uh, APC. Um, I think we can go next. Okay, so um, Schneider Electric is a company that is made of a lot of acquisition, or has been made by a lot of acquisition in the past. So each time we are doing an acquisition, we are uh, having, to, we have to uh, integrate the new company inside our, uh, our own network. And um, some years ago, we were facing some issues with different solutions to uh, secure internet access. Uh, we were having a different uh, proxy. We were having a local uh, uh, standards per country. So it was uh, creating a lot of issue with all our users traveling more and more. And when they were traveling uh, in specific countries, they were connecting to the wrong uh, breakout because if I take an example, I'm French, based in French. When I was in the US, I was still connecting to my French proxy. So crossing the world to get to internet in France, to go back to the US to access some of the applications that are, uh, that are hosted in the application in, in the US. So it was, it, was, uh, it was not very efficient. So we had a lot of uh, performance issue. And also, it was very difficult to uh, enforce a security policy because we did not have the full control of all the different solutions. And um, that's why we, we started to look at a, at a global solution. Uh, on top of that, we started to migrate from an internal mail, Lotus, to Office 365, uh, which is uh, hosted in the cloud. And we started to add a lot of authentication issues using all these different uh, proxies. So really, uh, it was uh, the key point at, at one moment to say that, okay, we need to migrate, have one solution to allow a transparent uh, experience for our users, uh, enforce the same security policy everywhere, and be sure that we can access all our cloud applications. So Office 365, of course, it's uh, the, the, the top uh, application that is used by all of our users, but it's not uh, only uh, Office 365. We are using uh, lots of uh, applications more and more in the cloud that were also concerned by the same, uh, by the same issues. I think we can go uh, to the next slide. OK, um, another point uh, that was very important, it was a real challenge for Schneider user. It was when they were connected to the, to the VPN, um, in, a, in a first, uh, in a first, uh, when we were having uh, our internal mail and in most of our application internally, it was very easy. Everything was tunneled to Schneider. Everything was internal, and we were using a lot of our bandwidth for internal application. But as soon as we started to move and migrate application in the cloud, we were facing an issue because everything was tunneled to the Schneider VPN, SSL VPN gateway, and then going out. So we were crossing twice our internet links to go back to, uh, to internet. So we decided to save bandwidth, save money, and try to, uh, to, um, to, to give a better experience uh, to, our, to our remote users, especially now that a lot of people are working from home, to put in place a VPN split tunneling. So everything that was um, going directly to internet to be sent to internet. But the security uh, team of Schneider asked us to secure this load, not just open everything and send it where you want. And that was also a reason why we uh, tried to uh, to deploy uh, the app uh, to be sure that it's running on the, on the laptop uh, and every time we are connected, wherever we are, inside Schneider, outside Schneider, it's everything is sent. If it's HTTP, HTTPS, everything is sent directly to um, to uh, to um, this scaler, automatically authenticated, and we have no uh, issue to access our mail wherever we are. And the experience is the same for a simple end user. He opens his laptop, connecting to Windows, and everything works directly. Okay, so I think we can uh, move to next slide. Great, thanks, Johan. Um, so I just want to cover a bit about um, why Zscaler app and specifically why why customers have, have chosen to, to start using it. Um, 
the primary reason, I guess, is that users are getting more and more mobile as, as we go. And, and the case that Johan mentioned before when he visited uh, the United States, uh, he still was tunneled back through France um, for his internet breakout. Um, the advantage that Zscaler app offers is that no matter where the user is, they're going to connect um, to our cloud. So you could, for example, jump on a plane in the United States, you'll be tunneling through the San Francisco data center, land in Sydney, Australia, and you'll immediately be connecting through that data center locally there. Um, so the user doesn't need to connect and disconnect and point to a different location. No matter where they travel, whether it's home, coffee shop, uh, through an office, even on a plane, they're always going to be connecting to the geographically closest data center to them. Uh, it also enables um, sort of two of our core platform products, so Zscaler Private Access and Zscaler Internet Access. Uh, they're both enabled through one single application, so the users don't need to juggle between a VPN and a, and a proxy for their secure internet access. Private access is, um, is a technology that lets you publish individual applications and resources on a network as opposed to a VPN where you're actually granting access to the network, uh, which can allow for lateral movement. The user experience with Zscaler private access is, is really seamless. Um, you attempt to access something, if it's a published private access application, you'll be tunneled automatically to it in the background. There's no need to launch and dial your VPN when you need to access that private app. And then on the Zscaler Internet Access side, this complements our existing um, uh, tunneling technology where you can uh, push traffic through our cloud. No matter where the users are, we can, we can proxy their web traffic from their machine um, through our cloud. Uh, we also offer a uh, separate administration console for managing the Zscaler app. Um, whether you're using ZIA or ZPA, um, there is a, a centralized view for all your Z app devices. This is where you'll define things like how traffic should be forwarded, um, what are your trusted networks, uh, how users should behave when they're in the office versus at home uh, from their personal internet connection. You can also configure interoperability with other VPN vendors and, and how the app should connect uh, geographically when the users are moving around. We also give you some additional client control policy that you can apply on top of the app. Um, so you can limit application functions, prevent the user from logging out. Uh, also importantly, uh, govern things like privacy compliance, um, GDPR uh, being a being a hot topic right now, we can also limit what information we get from the user's device and is available to administrators. If we look at um, a private access use case that I was speaking about before, um, traditionally with a VPN, what's going to happen is you'll connect to the VPN, you'll be virtually placed onto that network. Um, now most of them, you know, you can lock down policy and prevent users from accessing specific resources. But a lot of the time, this is managed by the network routing table on the operating system. What that means is if an attacker is smart enough um, and they can get access to connect your VPN, it can be as simple as modifying the routing table for them to grant themselves access to a different portion of your network. If you compare that to how the app functions, we, we, again, with private access, we publish applications and resources. We don't publish networks. So when I attempt to access an internal private server, I'm not, I don't even have visibility into the network address of that server. I get presented with a synthetic IP, I can access that application, and I can't have any lateral movement through the network or try and access any other resources that aren't published to me. Um, in addition to that, uh, VPNs also cause um, some other overhead issues. So if we look at the example, um, a traditional example on the left that we've got. Whether it's a private access or an internet access use case, the user is going to dial in um, through their VPN tunnel. Uh, you've typically established a security stack in your, in your network, uh, all of your various appliances, sandbox, DLP, SSL inspection. You'll need to tunnel the user's traffic in to your network, um, to the VPN gateway, and then that traffic will then go out to the internet. And so, again, like, like Johan's use case is that he needed to tunnel back to France just to get out to the internet from that connection. Um, this has a resource overhead, so not only on the device itself, but um, also on your network stack. If you, if you think you've got all of your users in the corporate office um, connecting out through this security stack, that's great, but then your remote users are also dialing in and using that. 
if you were to then open up another branch office and you need to backhaul that traffic, um, you're probably going to need to expand your security stack in that network as opposed to just pointing it to the cloud that you, like you can with uh, Zscaler. In addition to that, um, particularly looking at the mobile world, um, iOS and Android devices, for example, there's a data cost associated with maintaining a VPN tunnel. It doesn't even matter if I'm sending traffic or using applications. If my VPN is connected in the background, um, it's using cellular data uh, to maintain that tunnel. Not a huge issue when you're at home, but as the second you start roaming, those roaming data costs can really, really add up quickly, even with just the traffic to maintain the VPN tunnel. Um, and in addition to that, the battery life on mobile devices is a really, really key factor. Um, it's one of the statistics that the mobile device vendors always tout around how much battery life the devices have. Maintaining a tunnel um, so that it's always ready for when the user wants to use it does drain the battery. Um, and with ZApp, we aren't maintaining that tunnel to the cloud. Uh, it's it's on-demand access that's proxied through, so you'll, you'll see less uh, of a battery life impact. And then finally, the user experience. I mean, because of all the things that we just listed above, um, users get trained to turn the VPN off and on as they need. You know, you want to save data costs, turn off the VPN when you're not using it. And that's, that's just a, a bad experience for the end users. Um, another common thing that we see, and, and I believe Schneider went through this as well, is uh, traditionally for roaming users, you would want to use a pack file to route their traffic. Um, with ZApp, interestingly, you can actually use it as a pack management tool as well. Um, it doesn't have to tunnel traffic. So you can migrate um, to ZApp and continue to use your pack files. But I just wanted to list some advantages over pack files that, uh, that ZApp has. So first of all, pack management is handled by ZApp. If you did want to transition from a pack uh, only deployment, um, you can actually do that with ZApp. ZApp will manage the pack on the machine uh, for you. Um, the other advantage of ZApp is we get non-proxy aware traffic. So pack files um, obviously function on things like the user's browser or system, and any applications on that device that are proxy aware uh, will go through that pack file. But sometimes applications, um, a good example is Java-based applications, have their own proxy settings. They might not follow the system proxy settings to route their traffic. Uh, we can configure ZApp to capture all traffic, um, even uh, the traffic that doesn't follow pack files. We can also do location-aware pack changing, the example I mentioned before. Uh, you're always going to connect to the closest data center. You'll get additional client policy on top of um, just having a pack file things like preventing the user from modifying that, um, and if they do manage to change the pack files, the app will enforce that again straight away. And uh, another key thing is that you get visibility into the devices that you wouldn't normally get with pack. So we can get things like what operating system is running, um, what version of that operating system. And transparent authentication means that uh, users don't get those prompts for authentication in their browser. Um, and to quickly sort of contrast that against pack file, obviously with packs you need, you need some kind of tool to manage that. Typically we see GPO group policy managing that. You'll only get the proxy aware traffic um, and so on. So we hand it back over to Johan and talk a bit about deploying Zscaler app at Schneider. Okay, so um, when, when we started to deploy, um, okay, just to say that uh, we we first used with a pack file, and uh, it was not that easy to maintain because we have a very large company with a uh, lot of specificities uh, everywhere. So we decided uh, um, after uh, some years uh, using the pack file version to deploy the app, and um, we started with a automatic distribution in push mode using SCCM. So very easy. Um, we started by a pilot on one country, North America. Um, so that's uh, Canada, USA. Uh, when we say North America, that um, uh, it was deployed um, in one week. We tested on uh, 2,000 users, no uh, negative feedback. So we deployed widely, and in uh, approximately uh, 10 weeks, we were able to uh, to deploy uh, all of North America. Uh, everything was running fine, very good uh, feedback from the users. So then we piloted and deployed region by region in approximately six months. Um, we deployed approximately 70% of our users uh, using this method. 
uh, the other one are uh, all the laptops that are unreachable, that are never connected to the network, or that does not have enough, play, enough space on their on their disk to uh, to get the package, and that are uh, done uh, manually by your service desk after the full uh, and automatic deployment. Um, now uh, um, we are using the app, I think, for uh, um, more than uh, it should be. The, uh, we should be at the end of the second years. Uh, we should be 96-97% uh, of the laptop deployed. So I think uh, we can move to the next one. Um, the results are uh, very positive. I would say uh, that uh, now uh, the user uh, are uh, having a very good experience because it's seamless, it's transparent, uh, the minimal impact. Uh, every time, as I said before, the objective was to, for them, not to worry about where they are, where they need, if they need to authenticate or not. And now everything is transparent. They just open the laptop, connect to it, and start browsing. Um, and whatever the application they use, they are authenticated to, uh, they don't need to launch a browser first. So if they start uh, by uh, checking their mail, their mail is already available, even if it's uh, hosted uh, in the cloud. So that's uh, the first and the main, uh, the main point for us, the end user experience. Uh, no more authentication issue reported, so uh, we ha we have solved that, uh, that, that that problem, and uh, the policy now is uh, very easy to manage uh, through the app and through the portal. Uh, standard uh, security policy that is enforced and that is consistent uh, where wherever we are. Okay, so I think we can move to next. Great, um, and just to list some other other benefits um, that you know, you might not be aware of, um, ZApp is, is free. Uh, if you're an existing uh, Zscaler customer, you should actually have this enabled for you already. Um, it leverages your existing subscriptions. You can simply configure it. If you wanted to test it, just deploy it on a few devices and, and, and configure it and, and give it a try. Um, it's very easy to test and deploy. And Typically, even, even in the case of private access where you're uh, publishing internal applications, um, because private access is outbound from the application, uh, there's no additional inbound firewall rules needed. Um, so it's very easy to get a pilot going, test access to one application and, and see how it goes. And then from the ZIA or Zscaler Internet Access side, um, Again, it is just a, a, another forwarding mechanism, so it's, it's really easy to just deploy that application to a couple of devices, do some very minimal configuration, and, and start forwarding traffic through the cloud. Um, today we support Windows, Mac, iOS, and Android. Um, the goal is always to have the exact same user experience on, on all of those different devices. And um, again, to, to reiterate what I was speaking about earlier, uh, the network detection is, is the really cool part of it. The users just leave the app running. They don't need, even need to remember that it's running. It will stay connected in the background whenever they generate traffic. So that experience of getting an email late at night and needing to dial in um, to the VPN at work to, to do some work is, is, doesn't exist anymore. You just open your browser and access that application. So if you did want to um, deploy, and, and I spoke about this briefly before, uh, it's very simple. So configuring is as simple as defining your trusted network criteria, um, not even mandatory. You can actually just run it in, in one network scenario. Identify any groups or settings that you want to de deploy. Um, define applications and VIA policy. You know, you might want to block uh, gambling or adult material. Um, this is all very simple to do. Um, deploy the application. So, like Johan mentioned, you can push it for Windows devices uh, with things like System Center, uh, also group policy. There's a lot of documentation around how to deploy the app on our help portal, um, help.zscaler.com. And for iOS and Android devices, the applications are actually published on the respective stores. So, you can just go to um, iTunes and install the app for iOS, for example. Then finally, um, after that's done, you can just start to look at all of the traffic coming through the cloud. Um, the, the traffic from ZApp users shows up in the exact same spot as it would for a, a normally tunneled user with ZIA. So you'll get all of that reporting and visibility into uh, what they were accessing, was there any malware or spyware callbacks um, that we saw. It's all managed in the same location. 
Great. Thanks, David. So before we get to question and answer, and if you have any questions, that would be the time to submit them. I, I got a few queued up here. Um, the uh, we have an exciting user uh, event coming up uh, in uh, London, and this is going to be in October. This is Zenith Live. We had our, our North America Zenith Live uh, just a couple months ago, um, and we've decided to take it on the road. So if you are um, thinking about uh, learning about Zscaler or, or if this is something that you might be interested in attending, here's all the information for you. You can go to zenithlive.zscaler.com. Uh, and get all the information. Um, you can register there. It's a great opportunity to network with CXOs, architectures, architects and practitioners who are uh, exploring um, how to best enable their, uh, their company with uh, cloud security and how to securely transform you know, their application from a legacy hub and spoke to a cloud-enabled network. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and get to some of the question and answer. Um, David, let's start with you. One question we got, kind of let's, let's kind of back up a little bit. You mentioned the differences between uh, ZApp and PackFile. There's a question on what is a PackFile? That's something that Zscaler invented, or what, what exactly is is that for people who may not be familiar with it? Right. So uh, a PackFile <coughs> is uh, a way to configure uh, applications to follow proxy settings. Um, essentially, what you can do for a very light example, I've got my browser. I could put in a PackFile that said. Uh, traffic towards Google.com should go through this proxy. Now, if you make that much more complex and you have a few hundred rules in there, you can really get granular with how you route traffic. In the ZApp world, um, we use pack files as a way of configuring ZApp. Um, so it's not to say that you're going to be managing pack files that you would uh, in the same way uh, traditionally, but you can use it to configure the app. You can also deploy the app without modifying any pack files, so don't, don't be afraid that you're going to have to deal with pack, uh, pack files all day. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, one other question was um, around the idea of um, non-standard ports. And I'll, I'll send this to you, David. Um, how does it work uh, with Z app handling, like going to a specific domain at, at you know a specific port? Sure. So, um, so to start with, there's, there's the two core products that I mentioned before that Z app enables: private access and internet access. In the case of private access, um, it'll, it'll get any port, so you don't need to worry about um, only forwarding to 80 or 443, for example. If you're doing SSH, that will go through ZPA. So uh, for the ZPA side, um, that's the case. For ZIA, uh, we do only handle sort of proxyable web traffic. Um, typically, that's port 80 and port 443. It is possible to configure on non-standard ports, and the example in the question is, um, uh, 4443. Uh, if you were using one of our forwarding modes that we call tunnel with local proxy, um, it is possible to actually get those non-standard ports, as long as that application will follow um, a, a system proxy pack file. Great. So, uh, Johan, I got a question for you. Uh, one, of the, one of the guys out there was curious, what are you, how, you know, so you mentioned Office 365. Uh, what apps are you using with Office 365? So, for example, the question was specifically around Skype. Are you using Skype? Are you sending that direct through Zscaler? Are you sending that, uh, you know, via, via another way? Can you comment on that? No, no, it's the same way. It's a full Office 365. It manages the same way using the app. So we send the traffic through Zscaler to uh, Microsoft for every okay. application that is part of the, of the Office 365 suite. Great, Teams, awesome, Sky, okay. Everything. Great, great, cool. Um, one other question for you, uh, Johan. What is your, uh, what is your policy set up around uh, ZApp? You know, there's, there's this concept that, you know, you can control ZApp and you can allow users to turn, to turn it on and off and you can uh, establish controls around that. What are you currently doing uh, with your users re regarding ZApp? Again, they turn, turn it on and off or what's your policy around that? Okay, so I, I, I would say, at the very beginning, we were a bit shy to put this in place and uh, disable the fact that the user can uh, can just um, disable disable the app, the app. So we let them the right to do so. But internally, if you disable the app, you cannot access because you don't have any configuration. You go to the firewall and you're not allowed to browse in internet without uh, without going to the scaler. But externally, when they are at home, if they disable the app, it's 
it's possible and then they can browse internet but at the moment we are in a process to change that for security uh, reason so one of our next step and now that we know that it's uh, working perfectly with the app and there is no issue one of the next step is to uh, uh, put in place um, a password so they cannot uh, disable the app Cool, that sounds good. I got a follow-up question on, on, on Skype. So you mentioned you're sending Skype through Zscaler. What's the, what's the voice call quality are that, that you're getting with Skype? Are you, are, are you uh, getting good call con connections? Yeah, we are, good. we are getting very good call. And we, we made some tests uh, with and without the app, with and without Zscaler. Uh, it's more, uh, when we have a bad connection, it's more related to the internet connection we are using. Than, uh, than the where and the way we are connecting to internet. So when I am at home, it's not very good. Uh, whatever, uh, if I use no proxy, or if, if I use this killer, it makes no difference. So, uh, gotcha. and, and most of the time, it's quite it's quite good. Awesome, great. And and just to add to that as well, I mean, in, in a lot of our data centers, we are peered directly with Microsoft. So. Um, for example, in, in the Bay Area here, often I'll actually get a lower latency using Microsoft applications through Zscaler than if I was to go direct because we have that direct peering relationship. So. Yeah, and that's actually, if, you, if you're familiar with Microsoft's recommendations on Office 365, they recommend going direct as opposed to backhauling through a centralized uh, data center. That's, uh, that's going to give you the quickest connection um, for, for, your, uh, for your apps. Uh, one question for you, David. I'm going to read this directly. What is the impact uh, to mobile VPN like AirWatch, which creates on-demand VPN on a needed basis? Can both coexist, or if we install ZApp on mobile, we need to remove AirWatch VPN profile on the devices? So, um, for if we look at devices like Windows and Mac, um, generally it's not an issue. Those platforms allow multiple VPNs to run at the same time. If we look at the mobile world, um, starting with uh, the Android behavior. Now, Android as an operating system only allows one VPN to run concurrently. Um, and actually, let me, let me preface this. You do see a VPN connected on mobile devices, iOS and Android, when the app's running. Um, but that VPN isn't actually connecting to the cloud. That's, that's the way that we actually capture traffic. That VPN tunnel, uh, interestingly, terminates locally on the device at the app where it's then proxy to the cloud. Uh, so that said, on Android, uh, the operating system only lets you want, run one VPN concurrently. So unfortunately, with Android, you, you, you do need to uh, disconnect uh, any existing VPNs before connecting the app. On iOS, it's a little more forgiving. They do allow multiple VPNs to run concurrently, as long as they're of differing types. In the example in your question, uh, it sounds like that's set up as a per-app VPN. Uh, Zscaler app runs as an enterprise VPN, and iOS will let those two run simultaneously. Gotcha. Johan, I got a question for you. When you rolled out Z app, was there any concern from the employees that Big Brother was, was watching? Was anyone saying, hey, I don't like you guys watching my browsing traffic? What was the reaction to uh, the employees as they realized you were rolling this, this out? Yeah, yeah, we, we, we had such question and we still have some question about it and what happens when I put my credit card number and trying to, uh, to do, do, do this killer intercept this and, uh, <laughs> and can you, and can use my data. So yes, we still have this kind of questions. Uh, the message is clear. Um, it does not change what happens when you are connecting to a website or people uh, of the web on, on, on the opposite side, they can have your data. Uh, it does not change what was the solution before when we are using a local proxy. It was uh, still uh, reachable by uh, some uh, uh, engineers uh, managing them or reachable by the company when we ask for professional services. So you're never protected. Here, uh, what we say is that we implement a specific rules uh, to disable SSL inspection with this killer when we are browsing certain categories with bank information or business, uh, just to try to protect them as much as we can. We are storing the log uh, in our own servers. So we have NSS servers internally, so we can provide the logs and we can ensure that it's not uh, stored in, uh, especially for some countries in Europe that have specific regulation like Germany or, uh, so we need to, to store logs in Europe. And, uh, and then we uh, just uh, ensure them that uh, we are uh, monitoring you 
<laughs> and we have a contract with you. So this contract, right. uh, you, you <laughs> we we are in a partnership, and uh, we, you are you are not here uh, just to uh, try to to stall uh, Schneider employees' data. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and another question for you, Johan. So uh, it's possible with ZApp to configure the, I guess, the fail, failing behavior. So if ZApp's not able to connect for whatever reason, um, you can have it send that traffic direct, or you can actually have it blocked so the user has no internet access. What's, what's Schneider's policy on that? Uh, if, if you cannot connect to any data centers when you are outside, as I said before, for the moment, you still can uh, disable it and, and connect, but uh, if you keep uh, if you keep um, uh, the app uh, uh, and you don't disable it, you will not be able to access internet. And when we are on the internal network of Schneider Electric, we are using uh, even if we are using the app, we are going through firewalls and from the firewalls to your data centers, we are using tunnels and we have uh, some failovers implemented to uh, be able to uh, to, to have uh, multiple tunnels. Gotcha. Makes makes sense. Uh, I got one coming in, Dave. I think it was uh, for you. Um, what are the overheads? Like when you pass traffic through Zscaler, um, obviously we talk about this global peering. Um, what 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 type of overheads do we see when we send Office 365 traffic through? Uh, you know, our, our cloud using the app. Sure. Um, so not a simple question. There's a lot of variables in there, but in in general, it, the behavior should be the same, um, if if not better. Um, and the reason is, like we mentioned at the start, we have 100 plus data centers around the world. Um, those applications that you're accessing uh, typically have uh, fewer points of presence than what we do. So by using us, you'll actually be uh, going to the closest data center to you, and then moving forward from that to the actual application, we'll connect to the closest one there. Um, typically, it is the same or better in terms of performance and latency. Great. And I think I got one last question here around SSL. Uh, you know, uh, part of the value of Zscaler is being able to inspect SSL. How does SSL certificate management work with the, the Z app? So uh, with Z app, so we support the SSL inspection um, on, on all the app platforms. Um, it's simply a matter of ticking a box that says install Zscaler or install the SSL certificate. Um, Z app will actually download that certificate as part of policy and install it on the device. Um, when we look at platforms like iOS and Android, uh, the way that Google and Apple have, have developed those to protect the user's privacy is they do make things like SSL inspection quite hard. Um, so on those platforms, I definitely recommend you push the SSL certificate with an MDM tool or an EMM tool, um, as, as that will typically be more trusted by the device. Uh, but the app will automatically install the SSL inspection certificate on devices. Gotcha. I got one more here that came in. What's the user experience when a customer visits a malicious site? Uh, can they get to it? Do they get a pop-up? Do they get something in their browser? What's, uh, what's the experience? So it, it really depends on how the policy is set up. You can set it up to block, and the user will see a nice uh, block message in their browser. Uh, that block message is fully customizable too. So you, if you wanted to put your own CSS styling, for example, uh, to make it look like your company's. Uh, and then finally, you could do nothing but, um, but report on it uh, as well. And so there's a lot of reporting in the console that you have access to that lets you see exactly what users have done and what sites they were visiting. Well, actually, I got one, one more. We'll, we'll take this one. Is there a specific reason to have a different configuration for a user that's inside or outside uh, the ZPA tunnel, right? So I, I think the question is, you know, as I go on and off, um, is there a reason why you might may make some changes there? Yeah, so it really it really depends on what your requirements are. Um, one typical setup that we'll see is a customer has, uh, from their corporate location, they might have a tunnel established to our cloud for their whole network, uh, a GRE or an IPsec tunnel, and they'll send all of their users traffic through that tunnel. So um, those customers might typically, when the user's on the network, they can use that tunnel. That's going to be the default route to the internet. So there's no reason for ZApp to tunnel that traffic. Um, and then when the user's outside, of course, they're not behind that tunnel anymore, so you want ZApp to handle the traffic through our cloud. That said, um, it's completely possible to have ZApp on, on your network going through an existing GRE or IPsec tunnel and still tunneling with ZApp as well. It's really up to your use cases. One of the advantages or one of the reasons why people 
will continue to tunnel the app through those existing tunnels is you do get user identification. Because the app is sending an authorization header with every request, um, you can see exactly what users accessing what resources, uh, no matter where they're connecting from. Great. One more. One more. Uh, support. How do we support user authentication on uh, corporate AD to support single sign-on? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we have a couple of options for integration. Um, you know, you can do basic LDAP. Uh, we can also host a, a user database for you, or you can do integration with um, uh, SAML providers. Um, single sign-on is, is definitely supported. Um, the I guess the sort of litmus test for that for me is that. If your users can log on to their laptop and then go to, um, for example, an Office 365 app and they don't need to log in, and obviously single sign-on is configured there, when Z app goes to authenticate against the identity provider, um, it's using a native browser session. So if that native browser session can be automatically authenticated, then so will Z app. And we do have customers deployed in such a way where Z app is pushed out to their laptops. As soon as it runs and it starts configuring itself, it just logs in automatically and the user's forwarding traffic. Awesome, great. Hey, I think we made it through all of our, our questions. Um, good Q&A, I appreciate you guys asking those. Uh, those are some really great questions. Uh, before we get going, a couple other things that um, you might want to be interested in. If we want to learn more about Zscaler, uh, you can visit our website. Uh, you can go to slash Z app to get the solution brief on Zscaler app. Uh, and if you want to kind of get a little more understanding on how uh, ZApp enables uh, Zscaler Internet and private access, uh, you can certainly get some information from those requisite URLs. We also have some other great upcoming webcasts you might want to check out if you're interested. Um, uh, there's been a lot of buzz in the industry about zero trust security and how to enable it. It's been a real challenge to get zero trust up and running, but uh, the way uh, Zscaler enables zero trust security with uh, ZApp and ZPA is really an awesome uh, uh, discussion and use case. So if you want to learn about that, three ways zero trust security redefines partner access and how you can kind of enable that. Um, is uh, available. We'll have that on Wednesday, September 26th. And then if you're deploying Office 365, we talked a little bit about it here, but if you want to know Microsoft's official recommendations and how best to build a, a Office 365 network that will perform with the lowest amount of latency and deliver the best performance for your users and your apps, uh, that's Wednesday, October 10th, uh, and we will be spending some time talking about that. So, uh, Johan, uh, thank you for your time. I appreciate you joining us. Thanks to you. Absolutely. And David, thank you for your time. Great uh, job answering questions. Thank you. And uh, two other things. You will receive an email from us in about two days. That will have information on this webcast. You will get the presentation, which you can share uh, with your colleagues. You also get a recording of this if you want to re-listen to it. So look for that in an email about two days. And uh, we thank you for your time, and we'll see you on the next webinar. Thanks a lot.